Okay, welcome everybody to our Art Talk Live. This is part of our Celebration of Women Artists group of exhibitions this fall. And today we're very pleased to have with us um, a presentation called Marjorie Harris Carr, Defenders of Florida's Environment by Dr. Peggy McDonald. Um, this presentation in particular is supported by Florida Humanities and we're so grateful for that organization's support of a variety of humanities programming that we offer throughout the year. So thank you for joining us today. Um, this program is also supported by the Florida Division of Arts and Culture. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Florida Humanities, who is again, the primary supporter of this program, you can visit floridahumanities.org. They do amazing program throughout our state year round. And our Celebration of Women Artists, which features five exhibitions of work by women artists spanning 400 years, um, is supported by many sponsors and grantors. I'd like to thank all of those for their support today, and you can see them there listed on our screen. I'd like to introduce Angie Berry, our curator, and um, she will introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Grace. Um, before I we get to Dr. McDonald's presentation, we really wanted to kind of uh, loop in a little bit of some of the artwork that we have on display. And as soon as I started reading about um, Marjorie Harris Carr, it really reminded me of an artist who's in our collection. Her name's Beth Appleton. She's also joining us on this call today. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, Beth has been in our collection since the beginning. This piece, Back to the Garden, is one of the first pieces uh, that was accessioned into the permanent collection at the Gadsden Arts Center and Museum. And it's created by this amazing um, process that Beth herself, um, oh, are we seeing the, I think the presentation may have gone away, Grace. Sorry, let me fix that. All right. <laughs> Frankie. No worries. There we go. Anyways, Beth, um, it's back. Been, um, like I said, a part of our organization. She started the Art and Gadsden exhibition back in 1989, which eventually led to Gadsden Arts being um, created and incorporated and led to the Gadsden Arts Center and Museum today. So this piece right here um, is created with a process that Beth herself invented in 1989, uh, the same year. And it's a process where she takes watercolor paper, paints the watercolor paper, these vibrant colors, and then takes an X-Acto knife and meticulously cuts out the shapes and then molds them and, and, and glues them in a way that make them just pop off of the canvas it's, or the, the, the paper. It is really amazing to be able to see it in person. The, the photos really just don't do it justice in terms of the 3D effect that you see, this relief effect of her work. And this is a really large piece as well. Um, and is kind of dedicated to the work, uh, to the people of Quincy. Um, let me look at my notes now, where was I going? Um, so she started on this and she also uh, in 1992 started on a series called Floridala. So Beth Appleton grew up in, in Ocala and was really influenced by her environment a lot, is mainly self-taught her appreciation at first um, for art. And she's really always been inspired by the Florida environment. And you can really see that by the work um, on display here. So the Floridala is the piece on the left. And these are um, inspired by ancient, the ancient uh, art form of the mandala where you create the circular form of repeating um, uh, images. And she incorporates all the kind of I cannot iconic Florida images in these pieces. You can see the palm trees and frogs and lizards and things that we're all very familiar with living here in Florida. Um, and she also is, you know, is able to depict things that are kind of um, affecting our environment as well. On the right is Hurricane Charlie. This was um, part of a series that she did about uh, hurricanes and kind of their destructive nature and how it really affects our environment and you can see just the immense motion in this piece and feel that kind of um, gusty winds that we we know what they're like in the when we have hurricanes but also just how much it affects our environment um, but you know in the last 10 years or so Beth has been researching 
water, the water that surrounds her. So she lives on a tiny, um, on an island uh, called St. George Island off Apalachicola Bay, um, off the Gulf in Florida. And <clears throat> she's been researching um, the water by taking these hundreds of micrographic images collected from samples that she took. And so she then makes these kind of waterscapes depicting the tiny life forms and environments that she discovers from just one drop of water. And she really kind of views the estuary's tiniest inhabitants and incorporates them into her work, connecting the art and science. She was inspired by the shape of the diatom, which is those these shapes that you can see here, those kind of circular shapes um, or oval shapes. This piece right here is from the collection of the artist. Um, it's called Rising Tide, and it's you know really to bring attention to the sea level rise. But a quote by Beth that I think is really interesting is she says, if we can't see a thing, most likely we won't care for it. By being, bringing this world we never see to light, I hope to bring focus to the lowest of life forms existing in our food chain. They are beautiful, fragile, and their health is vitally important to our own well being. And so while Beth is exploring the bits of our environment that we can't see at the naked eye, Peggy McDonald's going to tell us a little bit about another environmentalist, Marjorie Harris Carr. So Peggy is a public historian and an adjunct professor at Stetson University. She's a native Floridian and Dr. McDonald is a speaker with the Florida Humanities Florida Talks program. She's written about local and Florida history for Foreign Magazine, Gainesville Magazine, Our Town Magazine, and in 2014, the University of Florida, uh, University Press of Florida published her first book, Marjorie Harris Carr, Defender of Florida's Environment. Dr. McDonald is an alumna of University of Florida where she received a PhD in American history. Welcome, Dr. McDonald. Thank you. And I was just looking at that beautiful artwork and thinking how Marjorie Carr would have loved it uh, because she grew up in Florida, saw her share, her share of hurricanes and studied this, the flora and fauna. Um, I think she would have been a huge fan. And um, I'd like to uh, thank you first for inviting me. It's such a pleasure. And it's nice to have this virtual format where we have uh, people participating from around the state. I'm going to um, share my uh, slideshow so that you can get a look at Marjorie Harris Carr. So um, Marjorie Carr was the subject of my doctoral dissertation at the University of Florida, but she was a Florida State College for Women uh, grad. So um, a definitely a good fit for this um, uh, exhibit in terms of a powerful woman of Florida, right? A pioneer in her own right. Um, and uh, Marjorie Carr was not born in Florida. However, she came here with her parents from Boston, Massachusetts, when she was two years old in 1918. And she was lucky because her parents were naturalists who taught her all about uh, Florida's flora and fauna. And she could identify thousands of species when she was a girl. In this picture that's over a, a century old, you could see Charles Harris teaching young Marjorie Harris um, how to identify seashells at Sanibel Island. He built this cracker style home. And um, this, is, this was Marjorie's introduction to the world in tiny Bonita Springs. Now today, if you go to Bonita Springs, it looks more like South Florida. There's a, even a gigantic three-story Mercedes Benz car with additional Mercedes Benz parked on top. But when Marjorie was there, Bonita Springs, Springs was so tiny that there wasn't even um, a bridge yet uh, to the beaches, including at nearby Fort Myers, which was also still small. And Marjorie grew up with a sense of how the environment was changing during the uh, rapid development in Florida, especially after World War II. In this image from the early 1920s, you could see Marjorie in the middle holding an alligator hide. Now, um, Jack Davis, in his biography of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, another of, of Florida's three Marjories, wrote that by the 1880s, Florida had lost uh, roughly 2.5 million alligators uh, that were harvested for their skin. He equated the destruction in Florida to what happened to the buffalo at the same time period out west. Um, Marjorie here showed riding her a uh, horse Chiquita, a descendant of Spanish horses that was caught wild on the Kissimmee Prairie. She um, was raised 
watching the glow of the Everglades burning in the summer when it was cleared for agriculture. Her parents taught her what a shame it was when the turpentine industry would um, work the trees to the point of death and then not replant them. Um, there was only a school that went up to the eighth grade in Bonita Springs. You could see Marjorie, the only girl in the bottom row. And when it was time to go to high school, they moved to Fort Myers so that she could attend high school, Fort Myers High School, where she graduated in 1932. And in her senior picture, she looks haunted. Um, her father died suddenly when he, she was only 15 years old. Um, he died of uh, pneumonia and she was a daddy's girl. Now, after losing her father, she wanted more than anything to go to college. That's what her daughter Mimi Carr told me. Mimi um, was childhood friends with my mother in Gainesville and she let me scan these images from the Carr's family photo albums. And, and I interviewed her over a period of several years. Um, and she's really the record keeper uh, for uh, the Carr family. Now, when Marjorie Carr went to college, um, the, she was really the product of a society that wasn't quite sure what to do with college educated women. And this goes back to the turn of the 20th century. Um, by the late 19th century, women were going to college in record numbers. But when we see prescriptive literature like this book uh, titled Sex and Education, A Fair Chance for the Girls, it looks like the author, Dr. Edwin Clark, was a supporter of women's education. Actually, in the book, he talked about the perils of educating women, that when women go to college and study and think big thoughts, and get into intellectual discussions that the blood is drained out of their ovaries into their brains and they become sterile. In this book, the doctor actually talked about an autopsy where he wasn't present, where it was a case of death by college. Now again, when we see this type of prescriptive literature, which was very popular, the book went through multiple editions, it's a sign that it's a reaction to what was going on a new trend where more and more women were going to college. Um, now, in through the mid 20th century, including at, at Cornell University, American universities would offer, they would funnel any women interested in science into euthenics or domestic science, also known as home economics. In this Cornell University laundry lab for college credit, you can see this, right, scientific methods were applied to the best way to wash the laundry. Meanwhile, at Florida State College for Women, instead of a laundry lab, there were chemistry labs. Florida State College for Women was the only one of the Southern State Colleges and one state college for women in Oklahoma that offered a choice of a rigorous academic degree of a strong liberal arts tradition. In fact, Florida State College for Women, of course, now FSU, Florida State University, was the first state university to receive the Phi Beta uh, Kappa Charter, the Alpha Charter, not University of Florida, which was then reserved for white men. Now, when Marjorie Carr, rather at the time, Marjorie Harris, graduated from Florida State College for Women, she was a member of Phi Beta Kappa, the Sigma Psi Honor Society, and a charter member of the Florida Academy of Sciences. However, when she applied for admission to Cornell University to the ornithology program for graduate school, the director, Arthur Allen, told her point blank that women were not welcome in the field. Fortunately, during the Great Depression, the New Deal offered programs that some women were able to take advantage of. And Marjorie Harris became the first female federal wildlife technician at Wallaca National Fish Hatchery. Through this position, she met the two great loves of her life. Um, and she was also able to work with whole live birds because the CCC had built uh, an aviary at the fish hatchery. Um, the first great love of her life that she met while working at Wallaca was the Oklawaha River. And in this postcard from the Matheson History Museum in Gainesville, you could see an old Heartline steamer, the Hiawatha, the last of the Heartline steamers at nighttime with a giant torch to light up all the 
wildlife. Now, this was the snowbird era, right, where uh, in reaction to Harriet Beecher Stowe's writing, uh, snowbirds came from the north to Florida to see the subtropical paradise up close, um, including at night. Um, well, the other great love of Marjorie Harris's life, she met when she took some sick quail to the University of Florida campus in Gainesville to use the lab equipment to test a theory. She met Archie Carr, who uh, they were married for 50 years and had five children together. And he became known as the, the world's turtle man, the leading turtle conservation biologist of, of his time. Um, when, they, um, when they met, they fell madly in love. However, when Marjorie Harris went, returned to work and shared her insights on uh, the sick quail she had taken to the lab, a coworker, a male coworker, all her coworkers were men, took credit for her discovery. She challenged him and her boss, who was never comfortable working with a woman biologist, fired her instead of him. Now, this is during the depression, right? And there were no jobs available. Um, Archie Carr was only making $40 a month and he wanted to marry Marjorie, but he couldn't afford to keep a wife. He pulled some strings and got her a job at the Englewood Zoological Research Supply. And here in this picture, you could see a 21 year old uh, Marjorie Harris Carr. Because of the expectation that um, a woman scientist would retire upon marriage, even though she was only 21, she had to conceal her marriage to Archie Carr. Meanwhile, at the lab, she learned to collect everything from cockroaches to alligators, and they were preserved and sent to the top universities in the Northeast. Um, fast forward to uh, during uh, close to the end of World War II when Mar Marjorie and Archie were happily married. Um, Marjorie had just had her second child. Archie took a job at an agricultural school in Honduras and the whole family lived there for close to five years. Um, Marjorie was able to study birds. The family had, uh, they benefited from uh, cheap labor. They had a nurse, a cook, a laundress, a gardener. And here you could see Tina caring for the car's two oldest children, uh, Chuck on the left and Minnie on the right, dining by candelabra, which freed Marjorie to join her husband in the cloud forest where she collected thousands of bird skins, including um, very rare species. Well, you could see her here. She's actually using a German dissection tool to stuff cotton into the birds until it came out of their eyeballs. That's one of Mimi's first memories. You can see her looking uh, intently at what her mother is doing. Now, when the Carr family returned to uh, Micanopy, Florida, just 10 miles south of Gainesville, uh, they had grown to four children and added an um, unexpected fifth child uh, when they moved to Micanopy. When David, the youngest child was school age, and then all five children were in school, Marjorie began a volunteer um, career as a, an activist. Her first step was to preserve about a thousand live oak trees in Micanopy um, by, by uh, uh, convincing the town uh, elders that they should become wards of the town. She moved into land preservation and here you can see um, a, a image of Payne's Prairie um, of the turn of the 20th century and there are these snowbirds. If you look carefully, the women are wearing black velvet collars, almost like uh, the women in Manet paintings. And they came to Florida for nature, right? To uh, f examine firsthand these um, relatively undeveloped um, uh, portions of Florida. Payne's Prairie uh, was preserved after a decade of work by Marjorie Carr and other members of the uh, Garden Club. And it was transformed as much as possible back to what it looked like when William Bartram came through in 1774 uh, and what he wrote about in his book, uh, Travels. Now, another local gem that Marjorie Carr worked to preserve was Lake Alice on the University of Florida campus. In this picture from 1968, you could see that the lake was struggling. Um, 
this was due to the fact that U.S. did not yet have a sewage treatment plant and they were pumping all of the effluent from campus directly into the lake. The decision that U.S. and Florida Department of Transportation made with no public input was to partially drain the lake and build um, a four lane cross campus throughway and 2000 car parking lot. Well, when Marjorie and Archie Carr and many of their um, colleagues from the U.S. Science Department heard about this and uh, they, the, uh, working with other activists, challenged it. And after a period of a couple of years, the lake was preserved. And today people will, uh, hold weddings there and memorial services. It's another example of a part of old Florida in Marjorie Carr's backyard that she fought to preserve. Now Carr is most um, famous for her work to stop construction of the Cross Florida Barge Canal. Um, which started as the Cross Florida Ship Canal uh, that was during the Great Depression. Now, there was only limited construction at the time. The nation was focused on World War II, on becoming an arsenal for democracy and, then, and mobilizing for war. So although funding was cut for the project, it remained authorized by Congress. And 20 years later in 1962, it was resurrected. Now, in this image of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers plan for Florida's future in 1965, uh, you could see, if you look carefully, Route 13B at the top that went from the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico with the goal of building a canal that would cut across two rivers, including the Ocklawaha. You can also see the drainage of the uh, Kissimmee River uh, in this map and of course continued Everglades drainage with a view that nature was a set of resources for human use, right? And the Corps of Engineers uh, did not take the interest of the public in mind. Um, now, Florida Defenders of the Environment was an organization that, the, uh, that Marjorie Carr was one of the founders of. And in this image of its environmental impact statement, which was not the first environmental impact statement, but was an early one. The uh, Florida Defenders of the Environment made the case from an economic standpoint, um, from a political standpoint, from a scientific standpoint, and historic and also a moral standpoint, that the Oklawaha River deserved to be preserved uh, in its own right. And the project um, was stopped, it was halted through a federal lawsuit and an executive order from President Richard Nixon in 1971. However, a third of the canal was completed, as you can see in this map, including the most controversial remains of the canal, the um, Rodman Dam, now known as the George Kirkpatrick Dam in the Palatka area. Now, this dam blocks uh, migration of endangered species, including manatee and sturgeon. Um, and what it does is it maintains artificially high water levels on the Oklawaha River. Uh, this is an artist named Margaret Tolbert, whose abstract expression, expressionist work captures the beauty of the springs. She's uh, pictured here painting a large uh, painting at Cannon Springs during a drawdown. So every three to five years, there is a drawdown of these artificially high water levels. And the cypress trees, cypress shoots come through, right? They start coming back to life. The clarity of the water improves and uh, numerous lost springs that feed the Oklawaha come back to life. Um, there's a, a free documentary about this issue that takes an artistic approach. If you'd like to see it, you can go to lostsprings.org. Again, it's free. The director is Matt Keen and Margaret Tolbert's art is uh, followed in that process. Now, a lot of people who have worked to save the Akawaha over the years um, hope that maybe there could be another steamer like the old steamships of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, this is another postcard showing snowbirds who came from January to April to look at and shoot at pretty much anything moved. But Generally, the idea was to marvel at nature. And should the river be freed, which um, Marjorie Carr was optimistic about, um, she said it isn't too late to save the Oklawaha. The goal is to reconnect the Oklawaha River, which flows north into the St. John's River, 
and also Silver Springs, um, which is unlike any other springs in the world. And that system, that water system, uh, the goal uh, is to, to make sure these waters uh, become healthy by reuniting in the, in the future. So um, I've done my best to get the length of this talk down uh, for this, this presentation. I hope I've succeeded and I'd love to take um, questions. We have any questions? You can put them in the chat if anybody's got any questions. Peggy, um, I have one. <laughs> I know that you said your um, you were friends with her, the oh, Margaret Tolbert. Oh, Mimi Carr. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I was just curious. Um, is that what got you interested, and in why you did your dissertation on her? I was really lucky. Jack Davis was um, one of the professors who um, I took his classes and he was on my PhD committee. And right before he started at the University of Florida in 2004, he came and visited with another professor, Mike Denham, another big name in Florida history. And he met with graduate students, PhD students to talk about potential topics in Florida history. And one name he mentioned was Marjorie Carr. And I had grown up hearing about Marjorie Carr. My mother grew up hearing about her, right? And about Archie, Archie Carr. Archie, his work with, work with turtles, and Marjorie's work to uh, free the Akawaha. So it just seemed so close to home. And I was thrilled that that would be uh, considered a good topic for Florida history. And then I had gotten to know Mimi Carr previously. She um, is an actress, a very talented actress and director. And she had directed me in a play once and I was at, um, uh, her mother's home at Marjorie Carr's home where we had a rehearsal. And so I actually got to meet Marjorie Carr. Mimi brought her out and almost like a teenager acted a bit embarrassed that she was there and said, okay, mother, and, and ushered her away. And it never would have occurred to me at the time that I would spend well over a decade researching, writing, and giving talks about her life. Um, but along with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, uh, Marjorie Harris Carr is one of uh, Florida's three Marjories, none of which were born here, but each of which made Florida the focus of their work, right? And, and Rawlings' work, not only through her writing, including The Yearling, but also later in her career, she became more interested in conservation. And of course, Douglas established Friends of the Everglades and wrote, uh, wrote about the Everglades. Um, and Douglas and Marjorie Carr uh, got to know each other. And um, uh, so anyway, it's a, it's a fun topic and it's related to what I studied at UF in terms of not only American history, but environmental history and women's history. So we do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, Jennifer Clenard asked, how can we best support efforts to save the river? I would refer you again to, well, to a couple websites. Lostsprings.org is a really good one. It's that artistic approach to the subject, right? It's not political. It shows the beauty of the springs um, uh, and of the Okawaha River and then examines Margaret Colbert's art. And it's positive. It's, she is the most infectiously positive person I know. And that is the way to teach about the environment, right? Instead of nothing but new, doom and gloom. So lostsprings.org is a great place to start. Another website is called Restore the Aqua, I'm sorry, Free the Aquawaha. And it is a, a non-political, a non non-partisan um, coalition of nonprofit groups that are working to free the Aquawaha. And it's another one that is, you know, it, it won't inundate you with politics, but it'll uh, keep you up to date on what you can do, right? What is, what is being done and what needs to be done. And of course, Marjorie Carr's organization, Florida Defenders of the Environment, is another good one to follow. Um, so it, each of those groups examines the science. Marjorie Carr's focus was not to be emotional, right? But to follow the science and to follow the democratic process. She wasn't a radical, right? She was a scientist who would study the issues, work with others, and she had a talent for um, getting experts, whether it was in the law, science, uh, economics, politics, getting experts to work, to volunteer to work for the cause of freeing the Akawaha River. 
Mm -hmm. And um, and that's something that um, she did until her dying breath. She remained optimistic until the end that the river would be freed. And I can tell you that the um, construction of the Cross Florida Barge Canal ended in 1971. That's the year I was born. I turned 50 next week. And that's that's how old, that's how long it's been since the project became defunct. And yet that little, little dam is still there blocking the river. Wow. Well, the, another question from Martha McLean. Um, do you know if there are any provisions in the new infrastructure bill to help with this situation? Oh, that's such a good question. And that is that is the ultimate goal, right? So people who are involved with uh, FDE or other Florida environmental um, non-governmental organizations realize that because Florida politics is and has for a long time been dominated by just one party, federal intervention is what is needed. So that's what happened in 1971 through a federal lawsuit that FDE was part of um, and through the uh, Nixon's executive order. And it's thought that that will be what's necessary again to uh, free the Ottawa. In terms of current funding for environmental topics, um, I would have to research that. That's a really good question. I'd like to see what sort of environmental um, cleanup or other sorts of issues might be included in the infrastructure bill. I'm not currently aware of them, but the bill kept changing. So um, I'm going to research that. I think it's a really good question. Okay, um, and another question, Marilyn Fever is wondering how long your normal presentation or usual presentation is, and are you available to speak with um, paddling groups, outdoors groups about this? Yeah, I have briefly spoken to Florida Paddle before at night at a, at a camp. Um, so I'm very flexible. My talk can go, usually it's 45 minutes, but I can tailor it to any, any length. And I love getting out and talking uh, to groups. It's, and I find often that uh, paddle related groups are very passionate, right? When, especially those who are able to visit the Akwawaha during a drawdown. Mm -hmm. um, and if you'd like to see what that's like, again, that uh, lostsprings.org um, website where you can see the, the documentary Lost Springs, it's not your typical documentary, it's an artistic film. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, I'm definitely available. I love talking about uh, Florida and especially Marjorie Carr. Fantastic. Well, that was all the questions I saw in the chat. Angie, did you have any more questions for Dr. McDonald? No, I think it was great. We just so appreciate you coming and you know introducing us to um, Marjorie's life and also just some of the kind of struggles that she had just for her gender. I know that's a theme throughout our exhibitions that we have. Um, the women artists for centuries of creativity, many of them face that as well. And so it's just interesting, even in the 20th century to see how much that was still happening and in, in, not even in the arts, but in other um, fields as well. So, absolutely. Thank you, yeah, she's, she was an inspiration because, because she was a woman, she was not able to pursue her career the way she wanted to. She couldn't get into graduate school uh, until she married another scientist and Archie Carr helped get her in uh, to graduate school in zoology at UF. Um, but she, she embarked upon her own career in science through environmental activism and just remained positive and optimistic until the end. So um, Florida State College for Women was such a big part of that and you know, living in Tallahassee, the education she got at what later became FSU was uh, what made her. Mimi Carr talked extensively about that when I interviewed her, how, how much she wanted to go to college and how being at Florida State College for Women just made her. And I'd love to see, there is a history of Florida State College for Women, but I'd love to see more, um, more about that, right? I love Tallahassee and the university atmosphere, but um, you know, the, of course, it's the sense of a women's college. You'd have to really dig deeper to understand that history. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McDonald. And Angie and I um, ask a favor of all of you who are on this session today. Um, it helps inform Florida Humanities 
um, regarding what programs to bring you, uh, what programs to support. If you would fill out the Florida Humanities Survey, it doesn't take very long. And Angie will be pasting a link in the chat. Um, we can also send it to you afterwards. Um, but Peggy, thank you. And I wanna share with you um, a little bit more about what's coming up at the Gadsden Art Center Museum. Um, we do have another online presentation. This is another remarkable woman in our celebration of women artists. This is Renee Lewis, who is an Orlando painter whose Fovis style work is about the lives of women. Um, that is online on December 2nd, and you can sign up for that on our website. It's offered free of charge. Um, and then we also continue our um, celebration of women artists here at Gadsden Arts through December 18th. So you can see behind me, the uh, Women Artists for Centuries of Creativity organized by the Reading Public Museum. So that is, as Angie mentioned, amaz amazing stories of women, um, what they accomplished against various barriers and challenges in their um, artistic careers and in their personal lives and their influence on the world around them over 400 years. Um, and then we have several more exhibitions of women artists work in our permanent collection and a wonderful local artist as well, Don McMillan. And then we have an internationally known artist in our Newberry Gallery, uh, Senga Nangudi, who is an African-American woman artist who specialized in installation art and dance. And um, that piece is sent to us by Art Bridges. So it's a wonderful grouping of work by women artists about women. Um, and again, please take this survey. If you can take just a few minutes, that will help us and help Florida Humanities serve you better. Uh, thank you all for being on our session today. And again, thank you, Dr. McDonald. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me.